Welcome back to Throwing Through the Hymnal, our video series on YouTube. And today I am joined by a good friend of mine, Caroline Carson. Caroline, would you introduce yourself? Good morning, everybody. I'm Caroline Carson. I am the rector at Holy Innocence Episcopal Church in Beach Haven, New Jersey. Which is right at the shore. Oh, what yes. a wonderful place to be, it except beautiful. in the wintertime. It's a little oh, rough. it's beautiful in the winter, too. Oh, good. See, I like that attitude. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about one of our Advent hymns, and it's personally one of my favorite. Um, I, I know a lot of people like Christmas carols, and they like them because you only sing them one time a year, but I really like the Advent hymns for the same reason. I mean, this is the only time of year where we get to sing these particular hymns. And the one that you've chosen for today is one of my favorites, which is Comfort, Comfort Ye Thy People, um, which is 67 in our hymnal, right? 67, and you're in luck. It is also a carol. Oh, see? Then that, that's, that explains why I like it. In my opinion, <laughs> it is also a carol. <laughs> so I think to start out, what I'll do is I'll read the words for us, um, and then we can just kind of listen to them and then talk a little bit about why this particular hymn is significant and maybe a little bit about the authors. And then we can go into a deeper level about how it speaks to us spiritually. So are you game for that? That sounds great. Okay, so let me start out with our words. Comfort, comfort thee my people, speak thee peace, thus saith our God. Comfort those who sit in darkness, Mourning neath their sorrows load. Speak thee to Jerusalem of the peace that waits for them. Tell her that her sins I cover and her warfare is now over. Hark the voice of one that crieth in the desert, far and near, calling us to new repentance since the kingdom now is here. Oh, that warning cry, obey. Now, prepare for God away. Let the valleys rise to meet him, and the hills bow down to greet him. Make thee straight what long was crooked. Make the rougher places plain. Let your heart be true and humble, as befits his holy reign. For the glory of the Lord, now o'er the earth is shed abroad, and all flesh shall see the token that the word is never broken. Those are the, the words of our hymn. So tell us a little bit about what you know about this particular hymn, and the tune as well. Great. Uh, so this tune is translated by Catherine Winkworth, uh, who's one of our famed translators, and she in her own right is a stalwart um, famed person. Um, Olerius, I don't really, I actually never really knew much about Olerius, um, the composer of the word, the text, and um, Johann Olerius was himself a pastor. That's about all I know, um, and I think that he is rumored to have published this in honor of John the Baptist Day in his time, but I don't have that evidence. Um, this type of rhythmic writing was very popular at the time, and this comes from the Genevan Psalter, as is noted in our hymnal. And I believe Louis Bourgeois was a uh, person who wrote a lot in this style, this metered style in music and in text. But um, this isn't really significant with the metered text uh, attributed to uh, or matched together with this particular tune by Claude Gaudimel. Um, and uh, so I don't know a whole lot about Olerius or about the, the writer of the, of the text, but of the tune, this particular tune, was not the original tune. It was a bourgeois tune. And uh, he was, I think, booted out or moved. Um, Gaudemel was an earlier composer from the late 16th century. And Claude Gaudemel uh, was one of the composers in the French style known as musique mesurée, 
which it sounds like what it is measured music <laughs> so and so that's why i mentioned earlier that this tune is a carol because carols are often um were often i think metered in this type of type of style um musique mesure is a style of poetic writing where certain syllables are emphasized more than others. So longer syllables, where, where the stresses are, that would be where the emphasis is. So in the in this tune, Gabi Mel wrote a tune in this type of music that matches the meter of the text, which is the whole school of musique mesure. So um, uh, when I heard you read it, I heard a little bit of that, actually, Amy. Good job. <laughs> so I heard, come for it, come for it, ye my people. Like you automatically emphasized more of the, the, the syllables that we would normally emphasize. And it, uh, this tune happens to go with that text like that. That's what I particularly like about the metered music is that it, it, oh, it, it feels like you're speaking it because the emphasis is natural. It's on those words that eh, it, it, there's nothing worse than when you're trying to sing something and it and it takes you off of the natural emphasis and you put your emphasis on the wrong syllable and you feel like that's it's right. Like, it, it messes with your mind. And so that's right. I, I do like that. I do like the fact that this tune clearly goes very well with those words. And so I thought maybe today we might try something a little bit different. Um, and this is something that you suggested and I really am game for. Um, why don't you sing us the hymn the second? I'd love to. I love to. Uh, it is one of my favorites. And actually, before I'll, I'll sing it, I'll, I'll give you an image to try and imagine this. Um, and with a good choir uh, in New Orleans, where I was a music director before I became uh, a priest and, and an aspirant and postulant going to seminary, I had a, a great choir at St. Paul's Episcopal Church there, and um, we we had this hymn scheduled. Uh, I put it on the schedule, and I wanted to try something different and when the choir director tells the priest i'd like to try something different that strikes a lot of fear into some hearts i think but well when it, the, what was different about this not was not just that i was adding a tambourine to help us keep the rhythm but that it was stylized in this whole idea of musique mesure um, and if you can think of French round dancing or royal court dancing, that type of thing where some steps are elongated and some are shortened before you turn. Um, I am not an expert at dance. I won't be dancing this, um, but this is what we try to do. We try to process down the main aisle with plenty of space um, to the rhythm of the words, which meant that the choir really had to know that hymn really well. Um, so when you listen to it, you can imagine a choir doing very well. <laughs> um, and then all the bloopers that came before our Sunday morning. <laughs> so I'll, I will, how many verses would you like? Two more. Okay. okay. And then I'll prop it up just in case I need to, I have some, I'm not sure the bells will work. Um, give me one second. Okay. Maybe the bells will not work today. Um, but imagine a tambourine. Come for it, come for it, ye my people. Speak ye peace, thus saith our God. Come for it, those who sit in darkness, mourning neath their sorrows, Lord. Speak ye to Jerusalem of the peace that waits for them. Tell her that her sins I cover and her warfare now is over. Hark the voice of one that crieth in the desert far and near, calling us to new repentance since the kingdom now is here. Oh, that warning cry obey, now prepare for God away. Let the valleys rise to meet him and the hills bow down to greet him. Make ye straight what long was crooked, make the rougher place as plain. Let your hearts be true and humble, so as befits his holy reign. For the glory of the Lord, now our earth is shed abroad, and the flesh shall see the token that the word is 
is never broken. I love it. So these bells are from Qatar, 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 ah. and uh, they're not really appropriate, but that's okay. They, that's all right. Uh, I didn't have a tambourine on hand. <laughs> Why did I have camel bells on hand? Don't ask. Um, it's so fun, and especially at a faster tempo. And yes. so I think, you know, the psalms are metered, aren't they? And they're, they're word sung. Um, and so it helps me remember that this comes from the Geneve, Genevan Psalter, and that this is something that is prayed. Our hymns are prayed, not just read along with us, but their active participation. Yes, yes. And, and I, I like the fact that, you, as you said, you had to pace up a little bit. I think that that can sometimes be reflective of the Advent season, that we tend to slow things down. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how many times do... do do we feel like it's a dirge or like it's it's set? And Advent shouldn't be a time of of sadness or sorrow. I mean, it's it's exciting and it's joyful and it's energizing. And to hear the hymn at that pace really reinforces that. You know, this is well, this, is, this is good stuff. I love it. And it, it reminds me that in addition to the uh, sort of apocalyptic readings we get during this season that look at the end times and to have the first Adam and the second Adam and these things that we have to ponder in our hearts, there is a quiet hopefulness, but there also is true joy, which I really like. Um, and then this is also the message of John the Baptist. So um, uh, hark, the one that crieth in the wilderness, you know, and so this is used normally on the Sunday that in Advent that, that those lessons arise. And uh, I'm disappointed this year that we're not using that, but that's that's okay. I can sing it. That's right. <laughs> You're always allowed to do more. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And Isaiah 40, um, you know, if we look at Isaiah 2, right? I mean, Isaiah also, um, you have the different portions of Isaiah, which are different times. Um, and so, this also has that element, um, make ye straight with long was crooked um, of time. When will that happen? When does that happen? When um, it can happen many times, I believe, um, making straight with long was crooked, because I feel like we're pretty crooked right now. Mm. Like, I think that um, that we need some straightening again. It's funny because this, this time when when I read through the words, when I was getting ready for, for today's conversation, I I I'd always, I mean, I had had sung this hymn numerous times. I've I've read through the words, I've prayed through the words a little bit, but this time, for some reason, I'm struck by something a little bit different in that very beginning. Of course, we we read it and think, "Comfort, comfort thee, my people," which is God comforting God's people. But for some reason, that second line really stuck out with me this time, which is comfort those who sit in darkness. And I, today I saw it as more of a call to us than just a plea to God or a conversation between God and God's people. I saw that as something that we are called to do as well, to comfort those who are mourning, to comfort those who are sitting in darkness. Um, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, to, that's to a beautiful really, truth. To really reach out to people who, during this time, and especially again, it, it's the winter time. It's it's when people are spending less time out of doors, spending spend more time inside. Again, we're still in the the depth of our pandemic, and it is brought a lot of sadness and depression on folks. And the fact that in the summertime, maybe they're able to get out and do a little bit more, but now we're being pulled back indoors, that there are probably quite a number of people who are sitting in darkness who need the comfort of not just God in their lives, but the comfort of, of their fellow human beings in their lives, too. It just struck me differently today. I, I appreciate that. I think that is a beautiful challenge and sentiment. Um, it's very holy at this time of year, anytime. But I, I heard what you said about being inside, and that made this line stand out to me, let your hearts be true and humble. And that we, if we think of how Jesus exposed himself as a baby um, and was true and gentle and innocent, um, we can strip ourselves of all of the things that come with this season um, in, in our world today, um, all of the secular things 
um, and our homage to secular kings. Um, and I think that uh, letting our hearts be true and humble stuck out to me for that reason, um, as befits his holy reign, as that next line says. Um, if we come genuinely to God, we will genuinely be filled by the Holy Spirit. If we are emptied, as so we can be vessels to be filled then by the Holy Spirit. And and how much more comforting is it to be filled by the Holy Spirit than to be filled by those material things that really don't satisfy us? The noise. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They, yeah. Yep. And the hectic and the you know. One of the things that I've, I've come to realize about Ab, I was in, in retail. I was a retail manager for, well, I worked in retail for a number of years, and then I was a manager for 12 years um, at a large bookstore chain. And there's, there's a lot of excitement at this time of year, but there's also, and I used to always say to the employees, if you can't enjoy this, at this time of year, then you probably don't want to be in retail because you do. You see so many people who are just exhausted and they're coming in and they're trying to live up to some sort of ideal that's been set by society. My kids will have the best presents. You know, my my family will receive what and I have to purchase all of these things. And it's all about that material. And I think to myself, if they just would take a minute and sit down and, and have a cup of coffee and just understand what it is that really is important about the season, that it doesn't have to be a lot of running around and, and hectic and crazy. And I think that, that that sort of develops in us as we age. Um, but that the, it's not all about the material. It's And it's it's even for people who don't, celebrate the birth of Christ at Christmas. For those who just have that feeling that there's something different about this time of year, that what's different is that we can be vulnerable and, and truthful and humble. And we can open ourselves up to the spirit that moves through us that we may not even be able to identify. We can That's just be. Mm -hmm. And just being, we can just be, and just being is itself an offering, um, especially when we're not trying to create something else, which is interesting to me because, again, the tune, it sounds, because of its um, un, uh, uneven metering and odd metering, the music goes again with the syllables, um, it sounds like it's unbridled joy, and it is, um, but it's insanely crafted. <laughs> it's very carefully crafted to sound sound that way. Um, and so the choice of using um, the music measure is, is astounding to me. Um, and so uh, unbridled joy, if you are able to really be yourself or be, or uh, be just be and be humble and be just be yourself um, is it can bring great comfort. You are then, you are then able to be a aware of other things <laughs> around you. <laughs> you're not, not, not so concerned about what you're projecting or how you're, how you're moving right. through the world, not, right. not putting on that image in that front. Yeah. Right. And I think that's why I like John the Baptist so much too, because he was himself. Oh yes, he was. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely was. And I just, you know, need the hairy suit for Advent, um, mm -hmm. but don't have one on hand. Um, and all flesh shall, shall see the token that the word is never broken. Um, and that, again, speaks to me for uh, timelessness um, and Jesus as logos um, and uh, was, is, and is to come. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I like that last line, too. And and an element of, you know, thinking ahead that the, the word cannot be broken speaks very much of Jesus's death and resurrection. You know, it, all that was done to Jesus right near the end, right up until his death, it still didn't break him. It still didn't take away anything of his, of his, of the word. You know, nothing was taken away from, nothing was broken about that. Even though his body was broken, he still remained whole. So, you know, it, it doesn't just speak to the Advent time, but to the, to the, future of our path. I like that. 
I like that. That's a, that's that's timeless as well, you know. Yes. And um, I think that the the idea uh, people uh, like you mentioned earlier about carols, um, mm -hmm. and people associate carols with only Christmas, but there's there are Easter carols, there are just other poetic things, and and then this um, carols are usually, I guess, not maybe not in music measure, but because of the tempo and um, maybe a, the meter of three often comes when you sing a car when, when carols are written. That I consider this personally, I consider it um, a music measure a carol, which is really cool to be on from the Psalter, and that Psalter yeah. was gigantic, <laughs> gigantic. Um, again, it goes back to I guess Olerius, and I don't really. Um, know much about him is except that he was after Gaudemel. So he was a generation or more after Gaudemel. And then Winkworth was in the mid 1800s. So mm -hmm. we have um, several different time periods here, which I think is kind of neat. Yeah. Yes. It, again, it speaks of the timelessness. Yeah. 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 This is this is something that that isn't just, you know, written for the music of today or written of the music of, of 300 years ago or 600 years ago. This is this is a piece that goes through all of time and and can be appreciated by everyone, no matter when it is that they're hearing it and singing it. It's a promise. It's a promise of good things to come. Like I think the Isaiah 40 through pretty much 66 um, is dealing with prophecies such as that. So um, or maybe not all super positive. I don't have it on hand, but um, but but for the time to come uh, and the idea that something is promised is also a comfort to us that we don't have to um go with a lot of conjecture we have this promised promise from god and from from um the life of christ and his teachings um and i i think promises are hard for us to keep <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's good to know that that we um someone else is keeping this for us and has done something for us yeah yep and it kind of it nudges us along then to be more attentive to the promises that we make yeah. Good point. Oh, good, mm -hmm. good point. Yeah. Because sometimes, you know, we can put those promises out, but again, especially at this time of year when there's so much that we can commit to and there's so many things going on and, and you know, it, you get to that level of hectic again where you're like, I, I can't believe that I've agreed to go to seven holiday parties this year and in, in a week, you know, what was <laughs> oh I my, thinking? In a week. <laughs> I also have to do church in there too, don't I? You know, and then, and and to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to stop and I'm going to I'm going to promise things, but I'm only going to promise what I know that I'm going to be able to keep, or the things that I promise that I'm going to do, I'm going to follow through. I I learned a lot from my mother, and one of the things that that I remember as a young person, her her really encouraging me and i almost say when she drilled it into me but it didn't feel that way was the idea that that don't promise to do something unless you're going to follow through and once you promise you follow through you know so you don't say yes i'll do this and then decide that you don't feel like it uh -huh. Even if you don't uh -huh. feel like it you you've promised to do it and so that 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 loop of the promise that that god makes to us and that we in turn make to god and the fact that we we have promised to honor this season as an opportunity for anticipation and excitement and energy and and not just be distracted by the material things in life i think we um also can promise ourselves um to try and hope, focus on hope mm. and promise ourselves that we will try to include joy in our whatever we do. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of talk of joy in the season of Advent toward Christmas. Uh, but, um, and we've talked about how we don't always see that and we're just, there are distractions, but um, there's, there should be joy to every aspect of our lives. Um, and by being, um, humble or or joyful, um, we then inspire others. You know, I, I just saw yesterday the wonderful film Mission Joy, which features Archbishop Desmond Tutu Ooh. and the Dalai, the Dalai Lama um, together. And it's recent, you know, they even mentioned something, a uh, COVID research in it or something, but um, it is so well done. Um, and these two very holy, very uh, devout men, worldwide leaders in rel religion um, and faith practice, um, 
best of friends, just best of friends. And they, you know, you hear from each of them about um, honesty and joy and truth. And yesterday's lectionary did us a dirty one and left out verse 38, Pilate's philosophical question, what is truth? Um, and so while we read that usually to include it, um, it's, a, it's a huge question that, that we, we consider every day, I think, um, in our decision making. And so as we approach um, Advent and as we go through toward Christmas and onward, it really includes the whole year. I mean, um, so that promise um, to include joy and to move toward hope um, can be ingrained in us for all, all like that never broken uh, promise all year long. I have the feeling that you probably are similar to me in the fact that there, there probably have been people in your life, and I'm just guessing, so if I'm wrong, you know, let me know. There probably have been people in your life that have said to you at some point in time, why are you so happy? Oh, yes. Yep. <laughs> they, don't, they don't believe me. They really don't believe me. Um, that and, you genuinely uh, are just happy. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't used to be. Um, and I, I suffered from depression and I long ago had been different, different, um, you know, things to try and uh, to try not to be, you know, rife with depression or, and then I think I think at some point we all in our individual lives hit a point where it's either rock bottom and you stay around there and then you might muddle up or down um, or you don't hit it. And so then where is your dark night of the soul? <laughs> you know, mm. well, I had it. I had one. <laughs> so, um, you know, you work through that and you you work on yourself and you work with others and everything. And then there's a decision to be made. You know, the rest of my life from this point could be so much better if I allow the inner joy and to, to really be yourself. Um, and so uh, again, Jesus was, a he was himself. <laughs> he, was a, he, did, he was a baby, <laughs> but, but there's so much that we, um, we say that, you know, he could have done this, he could have done that. And, and for our sake, he didn't. Um, and, you know, to, to not to be a warlike Messiah um, is amazing. The one who serves is the one who rules. Um, and so, um, that humility, you know, um, I think it, I think it can leave room for joy. That's fantastic. Not that I'm that humble. I'm a conductor, right? So <laughs> <laughs> not always that humble, but well, it, it, we, we try. <laughs> Fine. That's, you know what? You just hit the, all the nails on all the heads. That's what we, that's the best we can do. We try, we bring our best, we bring our attempt to the table, which is again, our offering. And I, I look at people say, oh no, oh, don't talk offerings. Wait till epiphany to talk about offerings. No, um, we come to the quote manger or cave. <laughs> we come to Christ um, as his innocent infant self um, with offering. Um, and then we continue to offer throughout our lives, throughout the the Christian year. So um, that's interesting. But you hit that right on, you know. I also think, too, that there's a difference between being humble and having low self-esteem. Oh, yeah. And, there's a and, fine line. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes people think that you have to you have to think poorly of yourself in order to be humble. And that's not the case. Humility is something where for me, it, it, it is the. The, I have to stop and sit down and remind myself that well, why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I doing what I'm doing because I want people to think I'm wonderful and pat me on the back and say, good job? Yeah, there always is some of that in there. But yeah. the real reason that I'm doing what I do, the real reason that I want to sit and comfort God's people is because that's what God's called me to do. And it all goes back to God. So if I keep reminding myself that I'm, I am a vessel, but I'm an empty vessel. And, and as you said before, bring myself as an empty vessel to God to say, you know, what do you, where's the spirit moving me? Where, where would you like me to go? What am, what am I supposed to be doing next? Um, that's the humility of it is emptying yourself out and saying, you know, I, I, as much as I think I can do and as, as well as I think I can do these things, I do them so much better and am able to do so much more when I say it's not about me. I think that also is in line with the, uh, you know, one of the, 
the, the tenets of good leadership is to also be able to follow. Um, and so I think that's um, a good, good way to be. Also being able to admit when we're wrong or apologize or uh, again, oops, I made a mistake, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's an, it's an honesty uh, in, it's in honesty. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there anything else that you wanted to mention about this particular hymn and set of words that, that we haven't touched on in our conversation? I think that if you feel like you want to just sing this and dance it at, at home by yourself or somewhere, anywhere, um, that you will great, get great satisfaction out of doing that. Um, if you begin to physically move about when you're singing hymns, some people sway, um, and, and that might be a little too much uh, if the whole congregation did it. But if you, you know, tap your toe, or if you uh, put your hand on your heart, or if you're actually, you know, doing this or something, if you're trying your best, again, to be part of the hymn that's whatever it is, this Advent, any kind of music, whether you, you feel like you sing well or not, um, I would say, uh, if people say, oh, I can't sing, I don't have a, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. I'm saying, well, oh, here's a bucket. I want you to hold it, you mm -hmm. know, so you're in the room. <laughs> so we're in the manger or cave. Uh, we're in the, in the place. Uh, we may be observing, we may be quiet, but we're there. And so I would say not just for this hymn, but comfort, comfort ye my people, speak ye peace, thus says our God. So we have a directive um, to bring comfort and to speak peace. And if you can do it by your presence, or you can do it um, by hand on, on your brother's shoulder, um, or if you can sing, or if you can pray, then I say you have responsibility to do it. I think, amen to that. And I think that's the perfect note for us to end on. Thank you so much for doing this with me today. Thank you and for including me. It's so great. And I hope that you'll be willing to come back and do this again with another hymn. Absolutely. Thank you, Amy. And for all those who have been listening, I hope that you enjoyed our conversation today. And we hope to see you again next time. Take care and God bless.